Do you fancy a free case of beers? Of course you do. And that is where our friends Beer52 come in. All you have to do is go to beer52.com forward slash paddock and pay the measly fee of £6.95 postage and you can get eight unique beers delivered right to your door that you will not find anywhere else. Beer 52 are the UK's number one beer club and every single month they bring you a brand new box with different collaborations, different breweries from around the UK and beyond and this month it is very very special because it's the absolute powerhouse that is Northern Monk. They've got eight different beers that you will only find in this Beer 52 box. Northern Monk have collaborated with loads of other fantastic breweries in this box, including this one from Rivington Brewing Company, an absolutely beautiful 7% IPA that's got a pillowy mouthfeel, if you can imagine such a thing. And of course, a brilliant hoppy finish as well. Let me just give that a little taste. Oh, fantastic. Mm. Also included is a smooth IPA and a decadent, lovely stout from absolute heavyweights, Neon Raptor. And if the idea of dark beers and stouts puts you off, you can just choose the light only box as well. And don't forget, there's a couple of free snacks in every single box. And it's not just the snacks you're drinking, you're eating, you're also learning because there's also Ferment Magazine inside the box as well which has always got fantastic articles and loads of information about the beer you're drinking and the beer scene in general. And after all of that, if you aren't satisfied, you can simply just pause or cancel at any time so you don't even have to worry about it. Head over to beer52.com forward slash paddock and again, you will get this box of beer for free. All you have to do is cover the £6.95 postage and packaging to get your box now. Once again, that is beer52.com forward slash paddock, beer52.com forward slash paddock. Go and check it out. Right there, welcome back to the channel. It is The Brew and it's a, a special edition because we've got a guest that we really want. And um, <laughs> it's Terry Christian. Unlike like most of the guests we have. <laughs> Great intro, that. Yes. Do you know what though? I just want to throw it out there because I was explaining to my wife and my son who didn't know who he was. And I'm like, listen, there's two sort of like professional Mancunians because it was, you was in an era of TV where regional accents just weren't the norm. Were they, they? they weren't there at all. Unless no. you were a stand-up comedian. Yeah, and yeah. it was two of you that sort of represented the city. Which is you and Tony Wilson, really, on telephone. Tony was posh, really, wasn't he? But he was, was Cambridge, wasn't he? But yeah, but well, he was not but he went to. Well, he's like, well, Salford, actually, yeah, if you Salford, want to be a technical yeah. one. Yeah. Right. But there's only two of you that really sort of like give anything to, to Manchester. So I'm really happy that you're here. And he's brought us gifts. Look at this. <laughs> gifts, look at this, <laughs> eh? Old sax. You know that's, what I mean? that's my United book, Reds in the Hood, all about growing up in Old Trafford, soon to be coming out on Kindle. There you go. <laughs> Can we get that in? There you go. Oh, that low. <laughs> I should have bought the Oasis one as well, but I'm rewriting that. Oh, are you? Yeah, I did it with Paul Gallagher. You know? Oh, all right, okay. When, when's that? City fan. He yeah. st still, still sends me little thingies about United and how they're doing. I go, get lost. Mate, they never changed it in a lot, eh? City fan. Even how the success they've had, they still focus on United. But you've brought loads of good stuff for us here. Well, I just bought, bought a few little bits and bobs, you know. Do you know so what I, mean? I mean, we're in our element here. We've got, you just, bought just to show that there was football before the Premier League, which <laughs> is a good job. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got some programmes from 1974. Yeah, United in Division 2. Well, I mean, my dad always What was your first about season? As one of the best seasons. What well, mine was 69 70. Right. So, my first ever game at United was United against Everton. Uh, our first home game is 69 70 season. Old Trafford, beautiful floodlit pitch. You know, Everton in their royal blue and the kind of white, United in the red and the white. It looked like looked like a dream. It looked like something, you know, proper in colour. Do you know what? That's, that's the thing. And that we I lost 2-0. Well, <laughs> and it could have been fans, fives. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think I even get it properly because colour TV existed before I went to the match. So right. I saw football on telly before I went to a match, right, right. which must be a very normal experience for people. Yeah. But for, for football fans of a certain vintage, your football experience pre-going would have been on TV in black and white, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's why every older fan that, that, that had their first experience after seeing it in black and white always talks about the colours. Well, because I can imagine it's just... Just a shame about the result. And, the, and then our next home game was against Southampton. Yeah. And we lost 4-1. Ron Davis got all four goals. Great who, player who he was. Who took you to your first game? Uh, our Tony. And I went with my cousin Philip from Ireland. 
and then the second game, he just went with a load of men. I'd never got taken by to, to any match by anyone. Except no. My dad got free tickets for City in the quarter-final of the League Cup. And because our Kev decided to be a City fan, he took us both yeah. on the bus at night for the League Cup. City won the League Cup that year, and yeah. City beat QPR 3-0. But they were in Division 2 at the time. Rodney Marsh. Yeah. Free just tickets fat and slow City, then. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have thunk it. I know City giving away tickets and struggling Well, he, he worked that. at SO, so I, think, I think it was blokes who were drivers and stuff, you know, they get hold of them, you know. But yeah, quite funny. But yeah, United, it was uh, miserable. I, I, I think I'd see, I think it was only the fourth game when I saw us win. Jesus. We drew one all with Sunderland. I think that was my third one. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't a great experience. What, what was your favourite era around that time? Was it Doherty? Was it, uh, yeah, yeah, Do Doherty era, but when we were fighting relegation after Christmas, because everyone, everyone thinks that Doherty was this all-out attack, but he was very good defensively, too good, and it was getting boring. Right. And then it looked like we were going to go down anyway, and the story I heard was that uh, Sir Matt Busby said to him, let's go down with some dignity. And uh, so then we started attacking and we could have easily stayed up. United that season, when we got relegated, just didn't have a striker. Right. And so we went down, having conceded in 42 games, 48 goals. So, I mean, the only, the only teams that conceded less goals than United that season were Derby County, Leeds and Liverpool, who finished first, second and third in, in, the, in the league. We, we actually uh, conceded less goals in Ipswich Town, who finished fourth. I but, mean, but, but United's back four, three of them went off with uh, the Scotland World Cup squad in 74 and they weren't the Scotland team now, you know, like they were, they were a good side, you know. But, I mean, um, I'm so, impressed by the, that and your memory of it all as well. Oh, no, that's because I did <laughs> Celebrity Mastermind just before Christmas, didn't I? I, I watched you on that. And my yeah. chosen subject with a hangover yeah. was uh, Man United of Tommy Doherty years. You, you won it, didn't you? That's a great one. I know, but... Just be I'm, I'm glad you won it. But, but, Teddy, you but, had to, you but had to win it, accident. You had to win that one. But by, when you say ultra-specific, they said, they said uh, um, Manchester United's first win under Tommy Doherty was at, was at, was at home uh, against West Ham, 2-0. Uh, Who scored both United? Goals, who knows that? <laughs> who knows that? What was the steward at the bottom of the yeah. street? Yeah, yeah, oh, that's that's you know, <laughs> who made the tea at half time? You Mike, know. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but what was worse was because I was a bit hungover because I'd done a gig in Belfast the night before and we're drinking or two and we, we filmed it at like quarter to 11 in the morning. Right, I was thinking, oh, my mates will be having a go at me, so I'm spending ages thinking about now who was it, you know, and you're just supposed to go <laughs> pass on to the ones that you know. And then I was moaning after going, oh, you didn't even get into any of this division two stuff, only that Steve Koppel. But it's almost because it was so old. Whoever set the questions didn't know the difference between an easy one and a hard ah, one. Ah, right. You know? Yeah, because they were a bit niche, some of them questions you had. But well, I, was, well, well, I was relieved you won, because I'm not being funny. Some of the others didn't do oh, well at all, it, did it, they? It was the general knowledge bit that got me through. Yeah. Because, because I was one point behind, and then I had to wait, and then she went last. And her first question was, what's the first letter of the Greek alphabet? And she said... D and I thought I'm going to win <laughs> <laughs> because to be fair I think I, I watched I've that one I've got this one in the bag yeah and I was like I was like going in for it I was like come on and then I was watching the first round and then the few struggled on their own specialised subjects and then when it got into the general knowledge I thought yeah you've got this and you did like, you did. but yeah we've got uh, also you bought because this is one thing me and Steve wanted to talk to you about today not just about Manchester United because you know we can talk about it any time but the word because yeah. we're kids from the 80s and 90s and if you were a kid in the 90s, Friday night, you stayed up late and you watched The Word. How many of these am I right on? Was it the first time Nirvana was on telly? Yeah. Was it the first time Oasis was on telly? Yeah. Fucking hell. It took me eight weeks to get Oasis on. Really? And, and when we, you we, say we, that, we only got them on because the band pulled out at the last minute. Who was the band? Um, I don't know. Fuck well, up, they, anyway. They, they, yeah. no, no, they were on with Soul Asylum. Then there was another Manchester band on called The Caliphs. They were like a rap band and they'd been signed for big money to uh, London Records. And so our music booker at the time just went, oh, look Terry, we can't have two bands from Manchester on the same show. And I went, so you wouldn't have two bands from London on the same show? Or two bands from LA on the same show? Well, that's different. I said, yeah, London's not had a music scene since punk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and Imagine arguing about I mean, well, 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 it, well, it was kind of uh, like, my lad over there, his mum, well, she broke the Stone Roses. And she was there, you know, she promoted them to radio and telly. Fuck and she that. broke them in off the back of, like, because she was also plugging at the time the Pixies, 
uh, Doolittle album, she was doing a uh, New Order Technique, James One Man Clapping, uh, the Nana Cherry album, Raw Light Sushi, all De La Soul, Three Feet High and Rising, awesome. all the good stuff. <laughs> Absolute man to <Absolutely>. me. <laughs> well, 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 no, no. So Mount Rushmore. Well, 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 oh, well it was like, it like, all but, like but, but the best you, albums ever. But if you did, if you did any of those specialist shows on the radio at that time, you know, on ILR, you know, independent local radio or on the BBC, that was all the stuff you wanted. And uh, so she, she was plugging all of that and then sent out the Stone Roses album and just told them how great it was. And, you know, so it, that, that cut through in that way because they weren't getting any, any national support. Oh. John Peel wouldn't play them because uh, the, the story is that Gareth Evans, who managed the Stone Roses, offered him a 400 quid bribe to give him a session. <laughs> <laughs> so he was they're, like... Oh. They're the only Manchester band who never got a session off John Peel. I was about to say, John Peel was like the guy who played everyone on it. Yeah, but yeah. certainly like the bands that weren't getting... Uh, time anywhere else. So, so, but, but the Roses have been around since what, eight, eight, August 84, their first demo at Spirit Studios. And then 85, that wasn't a very good single, So Young Tell Me came out. But I mean, it was such a slow was the build. album 89? Yeah. Uh, around this time, April, May 89. And it went Jeez. straight in the album charts at number 32. And it, no one outside of Manchester really knew who they were. But the volumes of sales in Manchester were that big. It came out the same day as uh, Disintegration by The Cure and whatever the Simple Minds album was at the time. And it outsold both those albums put together in Manchester by three to one. And that day, I've still got it on the reel to reel. I was doing a, a session, an acoustic session with the Pixies. So Frank Black and Kim Deal and then, was it Kid Congo Powers or whatever, they came in you know, to Key 103 to do the session and do an interview with me. And the first thing he said, because they'd been pressing the flesh around all the record shops in Manchester, HMV Virgin. And the first thing Frank Black said to me, he said, hey, who are this band, the Stone Roses? And I said, oh, they're great, blah, blah, blah. Because as they'd been going in the record shops to say hi to the staff, all these kids are queuing up because it was the day that the Roses album came out. Have you got a Stone Roses album? Have you got so they actually witnessed a phenomenon I mean, Kim Deal became a bit a bit obsessed with uh, Ian Brown, and that they they ended up with uh, was it Chaz Chaz Banks? Is that the guy? He, he was like he, he was from Stretford, and he tour managed uh, Nirvana later on, and tour managed the Pixies, and then I think he also did the Stone Roses for a while. So obviously there was all those right connections. Oh yeah, that's not a bad CV. Do you know he what sat I mean? behind me for about seven years at Old Trafford in Brown. Four seats behind us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I used to see him at you know at the match quite a lot. I mean, it's good when you see people at at, at the match. The old photographer Harry Goodwin, you know, who was the official photographer at Top of the Pops. He was mad on football. You know, could have been a professional player himself, and. Uh, he, he, he bumped into Robert Plant out of Led Zeppelin at a, <laughs> at a City Wolves game, right? A City Wolves game. And they had a bet, a pound, uh, that, that either Wolves win or it's a draw, because he was that confident City would win, Harry. And it ended up being one all. And he, and he actually paid the money to Jimmy Page about three, three or four years before he died, which is about eight years ago. The hell? <laughs> he, he saw him out of doing and said, hey, give Robert that pound. <laughs> You know, no not that he'll have needed it. About yeah. 20 quid now. Well, not that, not that he'll have needed it. Yeah, pound would have gone a long way in like 1971 or whatever. What, what's it like having all of those bands, like you just said, some ridiculous bands? Could, did you know at the time the likes of Nirvana and Oasis was going to do? Well, I mean, I mean you've got to remember, so I, I started, I work, I, oh I, I, I started working crazy. in radio uh, December the 7th, 1981, and I got a job there, you know, via being on this programme about, you know, kids on the dole in Manchester based on the on the Skarman report after the riots of 1981. So every kid that threw a petrol bomb at the police or ransacked a shop on Princess Road helped me get a gig. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Social mobility in action. You can see that. You've shared that clip, haven't you? Of you on that show. A few of them. Yeah, <laughs> of you on that show. And it's, it's great because it's you, like, just as you are. And then there's a few sort of, it's a bit of a mix in there's some posh kids on there as well. I think no, 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 they both in the, they couldn't find any Tories, so they bought two in. Right, that was it. Yeah, I think there's one that's like you argue a little bit with. Because, because everyone yeah. was complaining that there weren't any. But, but they, but they, they got, uh, yeah. jo we Johnny, got it. Yeah. Johnny Marr out this. Well, I mean, it was all inner city Manchester, unemployed youth, so there's not going to be a lot mm. of Tories in 1981, are there? No, no. And, um, no, no. But, but so through that, when I got offered my own radio show, I didn't know what to do. 
And it, and it was like, so I knew that I'd gone to school with John Marr out of Buzzcocks, so there was that excitement about something happening on your own, own patch. We used to go to the punk gigs because, not because we were underage drinking, you know, because mm. I mean, when I was 16, I looked about 12. <laughs> but, but I could get a pint by going into rafters, which is a night, you know, a nightclub, because when promoters had put bands on, you know, punk bands like the Radio Stars or Death School from Liverpool, we used to like going to see, you know, anyone like that. I remember seeing Magazine with the Fall supporting them. But what you do is they just wanted your £1.20 to pay for the PA and pay the band. So they didn't give a crap that you looked about 12. You know what I mean? It'd be about another 30 years before you were shaving. They just waved you in and then you were in a licensed premises till two in the morning. So it was fantastic. And, and the weird thing about punk was it was a bit like, there's an old science fiction movie called Logan's Run where everyone gets el eliminated at the age of 30, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, to balance the population. It was a bit corny now. Jenny Agatha was in it, wasn't she? And um, what is it? Well, that's what it was like in punk. I remember we'd go, He's 26, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no one was allowed, because Johnny Rotten was 18. Like, John Marr out of Buzzcocks was 16. You just thought, well, we're a bit dodgy about Pete Shelley. We, we suspected he might have been 23, but anyone over that, it was like, <laughs> yeah, we're not having it. And so you, you got into that music thing. You, you took it seriously, got into reggae. I mean, it was Rob Gretton who used to DJ down rafters. And he used to play loads of reggae. So when you went down rafters, what they'd play, he, he was copying Don Letts in London, who was like the DJ at the 100 Club. Yeah. And because there weren't enough punk things to play at the punk gigs, he'd play reggae, because it was rebellious type music. So he used to play Dillinger, Cocaine in My Brain, uh, all the African dub uh, albums, you know, Joe Gibson, The Professionals, Culture, Two Sevens, Clash, all of that stuff, when he DJs. So you're hearing this, and we're hearing it around our way, but it became very hip and something you got into. And then when I got a job on the radio, I thought, right, I'll play demo tapes from local bands, because it was all about access. And then I ended up managing a reggae band from Derby and got them a record deal, a major record deal. They're the only British reggae band that got signed to a major in the 80s and probably the 90s. What was that like when you started off in radio then? Did, were you given <coughs> sort of a free reign to play the bands you well, played? Well, I, I, I was trained was by on, people yeah. who were really good. Yeah, yeah. so you, you were given was a free... Q1 for it? Hey? Which radio station? No, this was BBC Radio Derby. Oh, the, right. the guy who trained me up, um, sort of in journalism and everything else, a guy called John Barton, and he ended up as the editor of the Today programme on Radio 4 and then resigned on a point of principle. <laughs> he, ended, he was the editor of uh, the 6 o'clock news, 9 o'clock news on the BBC. Uh, started off on the lunchtime news, news night. Genius, but fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, our very first show on Radio Derby, I had live guests come all the way up from Birmingham David Steele and Everett Moriton, <laughs> you know, at the beat. And, and they came in live, and David Steele famously said, because we had people we were chatting about what we were doing, and they, they sat in, you know, the way we'd have guests sat in in the word. And he, and he went, he went. I said, well, what do you think of this show then? It was terrible, really. He went, he went oh, well, it makes, 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 makes a change from what? From the usual fucking middle-class twats. And you're going... <laughs> OK, thanks for that on my first show. W. <laughs> but you didn't worry about that in those days. Uh, and then I, I remember going to interview UB40. Well, Ali Campbell uh, and Robin, who was the drummer? The drummer out of, of, of a... So I went, it was his house, his flat in Moseley. The day after Boxing Day, 1981, you know, pre-recorded interview with the Ewer tape recorder. <laughs> and I got in there. And like they, they were both going out, these sisters, beautiful looking women, and one of them comes downstairs and she goes, it's about one o'clock in the afternoon to get there. And she goes, here, look, Jim, Jim Brown, that's it. He goes, here, look, it's, uh, it's that lad off the telly, you know, because I've been on on a Sunday night. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was nothing else on, only, me, only us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So we, we'd been networked for like eight weeks at 20 to 7 on a Sunday. There was only songs of praise and the money programme. So everyone watched us. Even Bez said when he was doing the short, short, short shock in Warrington House, you know, when he was like 16 or whatever, they were only allowed to watch an hour of telly a week and would have one <laughs> cup of coffee. And he said... And it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Great disappointment, you know. They probably wanted them to watch Songs of Praise, really. 
But yeah, so it, it, it was kind of, you know, doing that, getting round there. And then Ali Campbell, he said, hey, it's that lead off the telly. So they were making me, you know, and then they got me absolutely wrecked. I remember getting <laughs> dropped off at the train station by Ali Campbell's girlfriend, you know, New Street, and getting on the train to Derby. And there's only one stop, which is Burton on Trent. And that winter was freezing. It was like it was like the, the ice age was coming again. I think there was snow on the ground from the early December till the end of January. And I was that wrecked. I got off at Burton on Trent and had to wait an hour for the next train in the freezing cold, you know. Trendy right. jacket on, you know, right. to look good. So you went from doing your bit on the telly, Radio Derby. Yeah, well, well, the Radio Derby show then won two specialist music shows, but I was always in, I always went to see loads of gigs, listened to, I had a really eclectic taste in music anyway, you know, because obviously where I grew up, it was like, you know, you were either Irish descent or Jamaican, so there's a lot of reggae, a lot of, a lot of the older lads were into soul music, there were, you know, our Tony then went to uni, came back with prog rock. <laughs> he used to borrow prog, he was in the same 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 year at St. Bede's as Rob Gretton, who managed New oh, Order and Joy Order, Division. Yeah, yeah. And he used to lend him stuff like Captain Beefheart and King Crimson. Just as an aside, just while you're on that topic, you mentioned Rob Gretton, what did you make of, you watched 24 Hour Party People? Yeah. Films? Like, what did you, how close I thought, is that? I thought Gretton. Because was, was it Paddy Considine, wasn't it? Yeah, him? Gretton in both films is yeah. just like Gretton. Really? Yeah. Right. I mean, he was funny. He was a good laugh. Yeah. I remember... Because um, I love Paddy Considine. Uh, I, well, I was curious how close it was. Well, well, well my, 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 my ex-missus is from Preston. Right. She's only ever been to one game in her life, and it was the one where when Brian Horton was managing City at Main Road on a freebie, really. a corporate, yeah. and we went 2-0 down. 2-0 <laughs> down thing? and came back to win 3-2. I had to <laughs> tell her, do not every game like this. Well. He was only there about nine months, wasn't it? Yeah, but he did, there was that one with, yeah. you know, they were 2-0 up, you know, yeah, after the Galatasaray game. So that's the only game she's ever seen to, been to. Yeah, but I used well. to, you know, because of Red Issue, they used to have uh, this co the comic strip in it, Bertie Magoo, The Bitter Blue. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. she used to find it quite funny, you know, Bertie. So when, when, she, when she saw <laughs> Rob Gretton at some do, he'd just been to see City Forest in, like, Division 2, and it was, you know, a crap nil-nil draw or something, Wednesday night. And, it, and he, he was at a free do then. I think it was, like, some inspiral kind. So she, she said, Said, oh, are you a Bertie? He said, what's that? <laughs> he actually <laughs> told him, a Bertie Magoo, the bit of blue. He thought it was funny, to be fair. You know? Mate, I love that film, and I've always wondered like, how sort of accurate Yeah, Yeah, well, well I, th I, think, I think that's accurate. Uh, and I, I thought, in control, I thought that was a very poor portrayal of Tony, yeah, to be fair. Yeah. You know, it was like... It was, in control, I can't remember who played Tony Wilson. It was Toby it was, Kebble it, played Rob Gretton, didn't he, in that, I think. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. again, it, that, that, that was fairly accurate in, in yeah. his general de like demeanour. Uh, but, but, yeah, yeah, it was a weird one, that. But, I mean, Tony allowed him to do that. He just mm. said to the writer, Matt Green, I should uh, control, do what you want. You know, it's a bit of art, isn't it, really? Did you have any... I'd be like that, make me cool. <laughs> I wouldn't wear a shirt like that. <laughs> Give me a better haircut. What about the producer? The is it Martin Hamnet? Oh, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah. Sorry, was that? Did you see the in Twitter for our party people? Did you ever have a deal with? Any, oh no, uh, no. Because I, I was but, curious of him. Andy Serkis played him, and he's just but, crazy. But funny enough, in yeah. in in uh, my class at St Bede's was a uh, lad called Chris Nagel, right. and Chris Nagel was Martin Hannett's, um thing. He was from Altrincham, and his dad was a music teacher. Really good footballer, mm. Chris. And then what happened was. For whatever reason, and it was weird at St. Bede's in the olden days, because it's like, it's like Borstal with incense. You know, there's no <laughs> failure, wasn't an option. It's a bit different now, I think, isn't well, it? Well, I mean, well, don't forget, yeah. you, you had to be clever in those days. You know what I mean? Now it's just shh, money or good at football. Yeah. And uh, so so Chris uh, failed, failed a lot. I think he only got two O-levels or something. I shouldn't be grassing him up here, should I? I think he'd be all right. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but basically, years, yeah, yeah. He, then went, he then went off working at Moonraker, which Mike Harden had bought, you know, the comedy folk singer. Yeah. And, then, so, and then he got a job working, working with uh, <clears throat> Martin Hannett. But Hannett was off his face a lot of the time. You've seen Twitter for our party people. So, the, so the, they, they reckon Chris Nagel did most, because he engineered the first New Order album, then he produced people like, you know, Yargo later on. Yeah. But, but he, he did uh, Unknown Pleasures. So he did a lot of the So we had work. him in our year. We had, Chris, we had John Marr. He was at my primary school as well. He's in my first communion photo, <laughs> drum with Buzz Cox. He was in my year at Beads. Year below us was Andy Connell out of a certain ratio and swing out sister. Uh, in our Kev's year was Paul Hanley out of the fall. Mm. You know, it's like, it's like Stella Street. Yeah, isn't it? I was about to say. It's all the, lo mean. the local school where they used to try and beat us up, although we were outnumbered because they were co-ed. 
<laughs> for a Catholic secondary modern, that's not a good idea, is it? Um, <laughs> uh, St. George's, that's where Marcel King got a sweet sensation went. First black British group to get to number one in the charts, even though the Scousers, the real thing, try and make that claim. Well, not on, not on this podcast, they don't. No, no, nobody, but it's, but it's not true. They did it on a... Cause the, the Sweet Sensation were an actual eight-piece band. The right. real thing were just three of them and session musicians. Ah. So they said, but, and, and they said, no, Gary Shaughnessy, the guitarist, was white. Flipping out, you know, he's outnumbered seven to one. <laughs> Let him off. <laughs> you know, it was, it, it was like, you know, a bit of cultural appropriation by him. <laughs> so you gone through... How did you come? How did you come about to this? How did you get the gig at the Word? Where well, 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 the Word because I, after winning two Sony Awards, best freshest music show How old in Derby. Did you miss that? Yeah, you must have been young. Oh, I was twenty nine when I started. I look, I look younger. Yeah, I yeah you do. I should have, like, I yeah, should have do. lied more about my age yeah, because the do. big pocket for getting big money off advertising is sixteen to thirty four. Right. You know, and and here I am now, thirty three. <laughs> yeah. There's one more yeah, year. You're good company, Terry. So am I. <laughs> but um, so so basically, it was like I'd been auditioned for the tube, like back in '87 for the ah, last series, right, and yeah. got to the last six, and right. none of us got the got the job. Yeah. So so they must I vaguely have, remember the tube. Was that not what Jules Holland was it? it was so it? well, it was to replace Muriel Gray and I don't know who the other guy was, but he wanted to bring a couple of other people yeah. in. And they ended up taking on Wendy May, who was out of some rubbish band from London called the Boot Hill Foot Tappers. And that young kid, Felix, who was only 13, you know, was in the Madonna, one of the Madonna videos. And they, they took him off and I was like, one day I'll knit your, I'll knit your bleeding paper round, <laughs> get me home back. But so I just thought with an accent like mine, no chance of ever getting a job on the telly. And, uh, after I finished on Key 103, it was then That was real, though, back in the day. When people watching this now would be like... Well, Couldn't even get a national national radio. Yeah. I did bits for Radio 1, I did, did stuff for Radio 4, but I remember uh, there was a guy who was a did, producer... Did anyone ever tell you to, to try and speak Queen's English or anything? No, funny enough, when he was doing this, this show aimed at fifth and sixth formers for Radio 4 called Wavelength Plus. Nice. WPFM. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the researcher on it was Joe Wiley. Really? Yeah. Well, well that's how I got the gig booking, booking bands on the word. But, but basically, <laughs> what is it? We uh, you need a family tree of your career. Oh, man, you know what I mean? It, it looked like CSI. It would, wouldn't it? It's, it's weird. Like I mean, well, it's just when you've been around for a long time, you, know, you come across everyone. But, but what happened was they sent me for voice training really? with this guy. He's going, oh, hello. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but he said, it, yeah. it, it's, it's not elocution lessons, it's voice training. Right. Guess what it was? Elocution, elocution lessons. Yeah, well, I mean, you could do it, but you just think, well, I've, I've got this far now. Mm. It, it's almost like... It's, I, I, I it, mean... It's, you, you have to deny the worth of everything you, you are. And what's even worse is I get, and, and you get it a lot of City fans, and other people in Manchester are a bit jealous of your journey. And they always try to imply that, yeah, he puts that accent on, you yeah. know, he's fake. And you go, well, I, Andy Spinoza, and, and I, I mentioned this on the James O'Brien podcast, Full Disclosure, which he'll hate me for doing, but he, he wrote a book, Manchester Unspun. So he sent it to me for a preview copy. And so I used to write, you know, the word page for the Evening mm -hmm, News, yeah. which is where the show got its name from, after I snidely chucked it in there. <laughs> um, so I used to type it in, he'd be off opposite me. And, and he, he talks about me, he goes, uh, yeah, Piers Morgan was absolutely obsessed with Terry at the time and would be ringing me up all the, all the time, blah, blah, blah. I said, Terry could be a bit sharp tongue uh, and, and spoke with an almost caricature Mancunian accent. So I went, I just about went like this. I said, Andy, you know, um, <laughs> on the phone, obviously, I said, I said, you know, when you said that, I spoke with an almost caricature Mancunian accent. What do you mean by that? Mm. I grew up less than a mile away from the city centre, just behind the Sharon Gospel Church. <laughs> I grew up a five minute walk away from MC Tunes. <laughs> Does he speak with an almost mancu caricature Mancunian accent? Or is he just actually from Manchester? Yeah. Right, he went. Oh, oh, I haven't got time for this conversation now, Terry. And it's about this would be about fourteen months ago. Right. <laughs> yeah, he never got back to me on that one. But you know, <laughs> but, it's that, preview, but, but it's that kind of almost like trying to. Do, they, they do it in the media a lot. You know, <clears> if, if they ever talk about, you know, so if you said that Manchester in the sixties had, which is a fact, had the the most nightclubs per head of population of anywhere else in Great Britain. In London, they go. Manchester, which is said 
to have. Right, right, right. But Trafford Centre, which is said to be the biggest shopping centre, the Metro uh, Centre in Newcastle, which is said to be. So they always like, whereas if it's in London, they just go, they just say it, even if yeah. it's not true. So there's always that kind of slightly disowning something or, or trying to put it down. You know, it's well, they, quite subtle. They've done it this week with um, London's the hotbed of football in the world because of the most valuable players in the world come from London. Be like, well, wait, there's 500,000 in Manchester. There's 9 million in London. Like, Well, great we Manchester's got, got more and more <clears throat> formula, but, but it's, it's one of those. It's like even, even in music, you know, with Britpop. Yeah. Name, the, name the London bands in Britpop. Well, you're going to go blur, which is Essex. Well, so it's not even Essex. It's Colchester. It's 65 it? miles away. <laughs> um, Colchester's not. It's, yeah. like, it's further like away. It's, 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 it's like going to York. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Britpop. I always think, when I think of Britpop, I think of Supergrass, Elastica. Yeah, where are they bands from? that weren't really... From Oxford. Yeah. Supergrass. Elastica were from London, but they weren't really... But I know, that's what I mean. I don't but then it's like, it's what, whereabouts in London? It wonders or something. I always think the Britpop thing was a bit sort of... Well, well it, 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 was, it, it was like that Camden scene, and what they didn't want was they didn't want a, a continuation of the Manchester, of Manchester, if you like, and that's what Oasis were. Yeah. So they hated that because it was outside of their sphere of control. You know, they didn't want to, they, they didn't want any of those bands to make it. I mean, it was quite funny with City Life magazine in Manchester. Yeah. Their tips for who was going to be big in 1989 and you know who from Manchester, and I can tell you one band that weren't included, the Stone and Roses, Roses weren't included. And, and they're the band who everyone was jumping on the coattails of. They became the battering ram for everyone. Right. And then, and you know, Tony Wilson, God, God rest his soul, tried desperately then to get the Happy Mondays and the Hacienda involved in that. When, when really Factory Records in '89, who did they sign? To Hell with Burgundy, a folk, a folk <laughs> rock pub band, pub folk rock type band. Um, the little big band, that, that guy, used Rob Gray, he used to like uh, busk in St. Anne's Square, <laughs> like a one-man band. But and the, then, and then the, a classical roster. In the charm of Factory Records, though, it was a fucking shit show. In that half the charm of it, though? No, no, I mean, well, what it was, was it's yeah. that, that whole thing of, and I wrote an article when they did Manchester, The Sound of the North, right, which is that documentary where you thought, well, the, none of the black bands got mentioned in it. Yeah. There's no Ruthless Rap Assassins in there. There's no MC Busby, no Trapped in the Verse. So it's to try and create this scene of sort of white working class kids with big, big flares as if they all come out of the Hacienda. And I wrote in the evening news when I reviewed it, uh, as, a, as a, the, that bloke says to James Stewart at the, at the end of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, when the truth contradicts a legend, print the legend, <laughs> right? Then I also use the same phrase in, a, in an article I did with an exchange of letters with Andrew Neil. When the truth contradicts a legend, print the legend. Anyway, when I was doing uh, this uh, turn on Terry, it was called, TV review show with Tony, I said to him, I said, because uh, yeah, obviously 24-hour part people come out by then. So I said, uh, yeah, so when the truth contradicts legend, print the legend. I said... Where'd you get that from? He said, um, I think it was a John Ford movie. I said, really? <laughs> Which one? He said, uh, I think one of his westerns. He said, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. But guess what? He doesn't actually say that in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. I paraphrased it wrongly. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I remember it in that film. I remember no, it. No, they don't say it exactly yeah. that way. They so stop, they stop the film, don't they? And they say, like, the film stops. Like, and he yeah, says, yeah, it's a yeah, camera, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, he got it off me, but right. he used to do that with loads of stuff. Do you know what I mean? He'd get it off other people. Like, when you go around town now and you see, like, these little plaques with, uh, you know, Tony Wilson, he goes, uh, kids in Manchester have the best record collections. Mm. He never said that. <laughs> right? He said to me, he said, oh, blah, 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 some A&R bloke uh, said to me that the reason there's so many good bands come out of Manchester is that kids in Manchester have the best record collections. And I said, well, I can see that, you know, because we're quite eclectic in our taste, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's only two genres, good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't do all that sort of, you know, we're not going to be listening endlessly to Black Sabbath albums or whatever. And um, so there's this whole mythology around Manchester, but we were always kind of cool. Or maybe we weren't, because, uh, you know, I did uh, Great Lives for Radio 4 about Tony Wilson. And it's almost as if, you know, you know, you get these people who are into the secret and manifesting. Yeah. I think he manifested Manchester. I think he did. 
into being <laughs> into yeah. being I think what he it just was. Spoke it into existence. Yes, like, yes, no, yeah. no, but I think he did because we'd always had like popular bands and big artists that had come out of Manchester, but we never had that kind of scene where we were all like seen as cool. It was kind of cool and a bit edgy in a different way. But even but, like the Hacienda, it's full of scallies and that still. Like yeah, always, yeah. Like, that was the, the, the move. All of it was. Yeah, yeah, but but then you've also got the myth that it was empty when it yeah. first opened. It was always busy on a Friday, Saturday night. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just, like, not a lot going yeah. behind the bar though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, only, it was only pub prices. They uh, tried to do a ticket system when it first started, where you got a ticket in queue, and then all the, all the girls and goths who'd be working behind the bar be serving their mates. You, <laughs> mates. you know what I mean? You got um, off. You got obviously the gig at the word, and you spoke about sort of having to fight a little bit as well. Like. Well, well, you had to because I I went into doing the word after, with eight years of working on radio yeah. at national level as well. You know, as I said, Radio Four, where they tried to send me for elocution lessons. Uh, you know, I, I bet it, that works well. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's tell. what I'm saying. So, Sorry, bro, yeah, so yeah. then, then when I, I'm suddenly doing a show with people with very little, all public school with very little experience, right? And I'm having to sit there, listen to them, which is fine. But we'd be in a meeting, and you'd all come up with program, you know, ideas for stuff to do on the show, and they wouldn't be used, or they'd use them weeks later, but wouldn't let you do them. They'd hand them over to someone else and let someone else edit them, and. It just didn't make any sense to me, you know, because if someone's into something, you let him edit it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I remember uh, interviewing uh, Keith Richards at the Rolling Stones, had him to myself for an hour and a half. It never got shown because they gave it to this guy, Jeremy Wall, who was, you know, one of those posh kids. who was like, you don't have to be mad to work here, but it oh helps. God, yeah. And he said, oh, oh, come and look what I've done with Keith Richards. So this is Kathy to back. You know, we, we had, had him all, all bloody afternoon. And it's like... He's just edited together all these bits of Keith Richards out of the Rolling Stones going, um, 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 and then two eggs frying in a pan. And he's going, oh, you know, well, they're past the Rolling Stones. They've, they're gone. Now it's kind of the unstoppable <laughs> sex machine. Jesus, wow. That's, that's just bizarre. I know, but then it never got used. But what was funny was it was all paid for by... Uh, American uh, AVL, American Virgin, and it was a guy called Ray Cooper, no longer with us. Well, he paid for me to fly out there first class, had a limo pick us up, paid for the camera crew, paid for the hotel, so he just whacked a big bill into Mate, 24 hours. Honestly. And some bell just fucks uh, it up. I just want to say, sorry, I've had a couple of um, super chats. Also, Nuruddin has just gifted 50 Stratford Paddock memberships. Big thank you to Nuruddin, that's amazing. Um, Andrew A's trying to get back to the football, been doing the stats. We've played 28 different back four combos in four sure, games mate. this season. Um, Samwise877 says, the only word that describes United is shit show. Um, thank you, Nuruddin. With the word, like I remember watching it, and it was like you had all these bands on. You have like Oasis, Nirvana. It was just it was to get the right ones on. Yeah. So you know because you didn't want to look stupid and miss out on anything. And the weird thing is that they would they they would resist you just for the sake of it later on. Yeah. And and even after getting away, they wouldn't have the cranberries on. Oh mate. They missed out on the cranberries That's doing linger. That's ridiculous. Sure. What was the reason behind that? Oh, because they wanted to have, you know, some acid jazz, you know, <laughs> they, you know white, white kids wearing Frank Spencer berets and goatee beards playing old <laughs> funk music from the 70s. That, you know, I, acid I, jazz or what, what new wave of new wave. Hey? Yeah. Did you get Oasis doing Supersonic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. And, and that was three weeks before it came out because it was the very last show of that series. What was quite funny was uh, Bob Geldof was, was the guest on it. And he said, oh, he, he spotted how good they were. Yeah. You know? It was Get mad because you had like so many great interviews, so many great guests. They're, they're a show and on terrestrial TV at that time as well, just before a record comes out, must have been big for them. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well, we were Friday night. Then normally the record would be out on the. I don't know. Did it come out the Monday? Right. You know, so so it'd be there fresh. So everyone wanted to get on it, and that's how I ended up getting Joe Wiley involved because on the first series of the Word, our booker was a guy from Leeds who ended up managing Steps and A1 and had come from Kids TV. He's, he's right in the, the words realm there, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steps and A1. <laughs> so he, but, but because we started... How's he gone from the words to that? Uh, fucking him off. No, yeah. no, he, was before, he was on that before. He was doing Kids TV before. Right. So he, what, he, we started off at six o'clock and he was trying to make it uber pop and I said, no, we'll have one pop band on, one black group on and one kind of, you know, indie type you know, guitar type band. Yeah. You know, and that was it because I thought that y you need to have that one thing where you think, whoa, so I saw that. 
I saw that for the first time, something to chat about, something weird, something a bit wonderful. You might not get it every week, but I wanted that feeling that I got as a kid watching, uh, you know, t So It Goes with Tony Wilson, yeah. seeing Ian Jury on, seeing Elvis Costello on, you know, and, you know, or, or else even sometimes, you know, the old, old Grey Whistle test, I remember seeing like Tom Waits in concert. Yeah. Think and I, and I was amazed. Think it'd be a YouTube yeah, podcast. Yeah, I always think the word now what would I think it, it would be definitely YouTube have suited or something like that because it would suited that, that longer now, form, wouldn't it? Would probably. Well, well yeah, I mean, I mean, it was a different era, so music meant a lot more. It was a lot yeah. more expensive as well. You know, I mean, now it's it's nothing. I mean, I, I was talked to. Uh, a guy, I did Good Morning Britain the other day, a debate, and the guy that was debating <laughs> this, this ex-Met Met detective right. was a big QPR fan. So we were chatting about the great QPR team of the mid-70s, you know, with Stan Bowles, Jerry Francis, Don Masson, you know, Ian Gillard, Clements, you know, they had like half the England team in there, mm. and Scotland team. And, but but we, we, we were kind of talking about how cheap it was to go to football, and I bought a league match ticket book for 76-77 season at Old Trafford for the Stretford M Paddock, seven quid <laughs> for 21 <laughs> home games, seven Mate. quid, and that was nine internationals in the side. For yeah. those who didn't pick that up, yeah. His seat used to be in the Stratford Paddock. Stratford Paddock. Well, it wasn't yeah. a seat, standing. Well, standing, yeah. standing. Yeah, so, with someone weighing down the back of your leg if you weren't careful. And, uh, and then... <laughs> And then, then happier, simpler but, times. But, so I bought that season you ticket. You say seat though, don't you? Because you can't say yeah, my yeah, better my concrete. Section. A couple, of, a couple <laughs> of months later, September, in you know, in the season, a few, a few weeks. Stevie Wonder, songs in the key of life, double album with a seven-inch single involved, you know, included in it. Six pound twenty. So that's like. So the, the album was, now was like five, six hundred quid for, for music. Ticket, yeah. Compa yeah. Well, if you compare yeah, it to yeah. season So an album was the same co cost as your ticket. Well, well it was a double album. Double, right, fair. double album, yes. But, but, <laughs> and it is yeah, a very good album, but, to be fair. But, but, but to, to, if you were going to buy three full price albums, which would have been about £3.20 yeah. or £3.30 at the time, that would have still been more expensive than your season ticket. As a junior. As a junior. That's fucking that's wild. That's ridiculous. Man. Santa Notch has got a question for you. Um, Santa Notch, who's a big fan of the channel, been on a uh, member for 44 months, says, ask him if the Mannix deliberately played the controversial B-side instead of Love Sweet Exile on the word and did the producers tear their hair out? No, no, I mean, no, we, we wouldn't. We'd let people do what they wanted. Now, right. the weird thing is, we was chatting about the guy from Leeds. It was our booker. The reason he got the bullet was because of the Manic Street Preachers. I wanted them on doing Motown Junk, right. which was their first thing. And uh, what happened was he told me they weren't available. Not understanding that my ex-missus worked in the business. Right. You know what I mean? She was working all the big bands, so and obviously working for big record companies. So I said to her, no, I wanted to get the Manic Street Preachers on, but apparently they're not available. She said, oh, I'll ring them up. I'll ring up the blah, blah, blah. Ring up. Oh, they are available. They'd love to do it. Fucker. So mm. he just didn't fancy it and then lied to you. Yeah, say, yeah, yeah. Know, so so, so, so he, he could get the equivalent of steps on. <laughs> Probably EMF again. Do, do you know what I loved as well about the word, Terry? It wasn't just the bands. You had some big interviews as well. Like do, I, I'm sitting here thinking, because like, yeah. I want to talk about Oliver Reed. Oliver Reed. Eddie the Oliver, as well. Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Oliver Reed. Him. Arnold. Cool. James Brown. I'll let you talk about Eddie Murphy. Uh, Oliver Reed, and then I want to talk to you about Eddie Murphy. So yeah. that's one of my favourite moments. Oliver Reed's me. appearance is like aspirational to me I think <laughs> to just be fucking shirtless and that drunk how mad I was he I thought it was a waste did you, you reckon if you think, oh, I think he was we're, wasted we're, yeah he was, no, he no, was. no 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 but, but we hadn't had a really good guest on that series so and then suddenly we, on one week we've got Oliver Reed and Bill Hicks <laughs> and Bill Hicks and, and, man. and Oliver Reed as a proper guest to speak to yeah. would have been fantastic. Did he hang instead, out at all, or did he just come on and No, no, they, well, they, they just got him drunk backstage, but he wasn't really just pretending to be drunk. He knew what was going on. Did he on. know he was, he was on the Yeah, room, yeah. of course, because yeah. his managers, they always be, but I mean, you know, so it's one of them, you don't have to be mad, but it helps. Yeah. So, it's, so, you know, it was Tarquin's idea, you know, and it, so, 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 you know, or Tristram, <laughs> or Quentin, or Sebastian, <laughs> I don't I don't know or Rupert, say. you know what I mean? I love, do you know what I love about the Eddie Murphy thing, uh, interview? You interviewed him, and he says, I love your accent. He said, I love that Cockney accent, and I remember you like, hang on a minute. Oh, no, 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 he started doing a Cockney accent. That was it, and you went, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a Cockney, and he went, hey man, he's getting all, all offended yeah, now. Was a Cockney. Hey, <laughs> what he was like though, so he'd done an album of music. Yeah, it was, like, oh, was it like when I was awful. a king and all that? Oh, yeah. I think he was deeper right. into cocaine than you ever got. For, for yeah. Motown, he, 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 he no. couldn't man, sing. Big James was his producer, he, so he, he, probably he, right. he mixed it himself, everything. Was so, this party all the time and all that? So, so, yeah, yeah, so, 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 so I got, 
got an hour you with him. I got an hour with him at the, Mondrian, yeah. at the Mondrian Hotel <laughs> in LA, and it was supposed to be more about his music, nothing else. And he man, insisted on certain types of uncut pulpery on every flat surface, certain incense being burnt, muslin over the windows, not net curtains, muslin. muslin right, you know, okay. I'll whatever. have to Google that one. Well, Even though Google weren't a thing at the time. curtains right. were a bit thicker, and then it lit in a certain way with these scented candles and everything. So anyway, he come he comes in then with and it's it's a cocaine and a mixing bowl. It's, it's like, you know, I mean you're talking it's like June June in LA. It's like 90 degrees outside, you know, yeah. in a dry desert type heat. And he comes in to the room with all with all these big black guys with big puffer jackets on, you know, as if they come straight out of the, the middle of winter in Chicago Southside or something. So they all come come in like that, looking like you know American football players. And I go like that. Oh hi Eddie, I'm Terry from Channel Four. I'll be doing the interview with you. And he just just turned his back on me like that. Really? <laughs> so, so I go oh, okay, right. No. Get it settled. It's a good start. Sit down. Then he's my best mate for like forty five minutes an hour. Yeah. You know, doing all that. He was great. So funny. Yeah, he yeah, was really I loved Eddie Murphy. I remember watching that interview. And then, and then, and then, then at the end, I went, I went, oh, listen, thanks for that. Brilliant. And he just went again. Really? <laughs> just straight out of the, out of the. Uh... I mean, I would have understood it. Would have said it was COVID. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> Say you've got a fever, but yeah. So yeah, really weird. But um, there was it went it had a weird sort of. I don't know if it was a, it went a certain direction or it always had a bit of that because. Then you had stuff like, obviously, the hopefuls seem to be a well, bit of see, a watershed I, I, moment I, I, for I me as a like, fan. So we only really start, hopefuls, we, we only really started doing that right. halfway through right. series four. It, if anyone who doesn't know what the hopefuls are, can no, I just, no, 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 I just right. missed it. My, I, remember go, I remember going to your show about this and I said, I warned my missus because she didn't really remember what I said. If he gets to the old fools, I warn you, it's going to be some disgusting things. And it was these guys that wanted to get on the telly or people. So they do things like eat pubes, their own pubes off a cracker. Yeah. That's the one that's showing me show. Yeah, lick someone's armpit, a, a big person's armpit after they've been on a. Oh no, I think I do bike. remember some they of do these disgusting things. Jack oh, no, worse than that. Just, I, mean, I mean, the armpit one with his water spray. I didn't know it was yeah. on the hopefuls. Fixed. Yeah, it was. It was minging. Drinking a, a, a bit of one pint of your own vomit. It's yeah. an old medical student's thing. It was. It was gross, right? But I, as a fan, I always thought you don't really need this on the word. This is no, like, no. I, not, I, 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 I hate I mean? it. This is just nonsense. That's not. And Tarquin, yeah. you don't have to be mad to yeah, work here, but it, it helps. Right. And then it sort of distracted from the other stuff, and that was well, well, what well, it, it became about. It, so it meant we couldn't get as good a guess on because they go, well, "What's the point of me going on that show when I'm going to be eclipsed by some bloke from Stoke on Trent eating a worm sandwich?" Yeah, you know? and it's like, it was, it was, and that was just that, that was a yeah, it was a bloke from Stoke on Trent who ate <laughs> the worm sandwich. <laughs> was that when you was probably started, Jonathan Gullis? But nice, nicely done. Um, was that when you start? Did you start to sort of lose a little bit of enthusiasm now? Was, well, 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 yeah, be, be, because because, because it's kind of. I was all. I mean, and I talk about this when I do the stand-up yeah. show about the word. I was always associated with the negative stuff like that, even though I hated it. Did you Where, revel in that though? No, the, I hate. The no, 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 because it, it, it was it was just because they wanted to attack you because you were northern, you were working class, yeah. blah blah blah. I mean, I was just like, I have five years of it. Right. None of it was true. Even I remember like a uh, Piers Morgan doing a thing in the Sun, a double page spread. Terry Christian, twenty of my favourite things. <laughs> and it was like, oh, what's your favourite food? Well, I, I like pizza. I hate pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't hate it, but I'm not a big fan yeah. of it. And then it was like, I believe you're into music. Yes, I've been listening a lot to the uh, new Jason Donovan album <laughs> recently. Oh, so mate. it was all written to make you look as naff as possible, but they would do it all the time. I remember like Melody Maker coming down when we had, um, oh gosh, I, I can't remember the band, the band on now, but Teenage Fan Club were on the same week. Right. Mega City 4, that was it. We had Mega City 4 on Teenage Fan Club. There were two of the bands that week. And so in it, Mega City 4 were, were really chuffed about getting on the word. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was yeah. a big thing for them. And uh, so they were being interviewed about it, saying, well, why would you want to go on the word with that? So I said, well, we, we spoke to him. He seemed all right. And they are going, oh, God, he's such a dick. Uh, we then spoke to Terry about uh, what bands are on the show this week. And he said, uh, uh, Mega City 4 and some Scottish band I've never heard of. The Scottish band Teenage Fan Club that had made me album of the week about six months earlier. Right. You know, it, but, yeah. but it's like, so they do that. And they could get away with it because you can't sue. There's no money in it. But it, it kind of... It creates an image of you that just isn't. It's quite. You can still go and batter Piers Morgan, though. Well, I mean, <laughs> House of Cards, and it was quite funny because <laughs> the first time I did something with Piers Morgan, 
face to face because I, I, other than him ringing me up and me hanging up on him we had no relationship but you know it went on for years oh just the same as him I did a two way stuff. with him the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the Monday the Monday that the nice. Monday after Jose Mourinho got the job as the United manager so I was outside Old Trafford doing this two way with him live I and, saw that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so, I about that. so it was like uh, uh, and, and, and so I was well I, I kind of knew that Mourinho was like the worst manager United ever had yeah and uh, I just remember, like, at the end of it, Piers said, well, thank you, Terry. And I said, and thank you, Piers. It's the first time you've asked me a question and not made up the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> My revenge at last. You shouldn't really get triggered, though. I've had the, I've had the therapy. I don't know how you do all those debates, Terry. No, I've seen you on oh, Question I'm Time. I'm out of them I've now. seen you on I've Question got, Time arguing on, uh, you know, about Brexit and stuff. There's, no, there's no point knowing stuff yeah. when you can just have a Dave down the pub worldview. Yeah. Honestly, mate. <laughs> and then I've seen you on I, 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 put, I put something on Twitter the other day about how great the, the trains are in Finland. You know, they've got, like, nurseries with books. And everyone's going, yeah, well, we can't do that with all the multicultural <laughs> stuff over here and I went, okay you know like but, the, the complete non secutor yeah uh, right okay I got, I got blocked by the leader of Britain first this week yeah oh, good yeah, yeah he's done well there. Yeah. 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 yeah well I'm so proud of you but honestly <laughs> I think I think actually between the two of you I think you've argued with everyone on Twitter at one point same old grift I've got I've got I've got I've, 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 I've decided to stop it but they're just all there anyway they just keep coming up on you popping up on your feet no I noticed it there's, no, there's a great picture of me with Jimmy Savile right? oh mate yeah no, Get that rammed on your throat. But you I did a thing. Jesus. Hey, Kev, don't, don't say that. <laughs> it's getting rammed down your throat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like... Um, <laughs> but it's like... So there's your socials clip. I was doing a documentary on Harry Goodwin, you know, the top of the pop photographer. So yeah. we had an exhibition at the v in London. <laughs> right. And so obviously, to open the exhibition, the guy who presented the first... Because Top of the Pops came from Manchester for the first 18 months. They get Jimmy Savile to do it. So I do a quick box pop with him. There's a press photo of me and him. And every time he judges me, here's you with your best mate, Jimmy Savile. You know, when you, made, when you became best mates, you bonded in 45 seconds. <laughs> and what was it like? Uh, <laughs> you know, da, da, da. And then... Uh, what's quite funny, though, you know, when they made the Netflix documentary, I owned the footage. So I had uh, Jimmy Savile, when he gets up to introduce it with those demonic sort of reddish sunglasses on and I sold 20 seconds of him getting up onto the podium because they didn't have any this was only about a year before he died they didn't have any later footage of him right. and I got 1500 quid for it well there you, go, you see happy days yeah. hey, worth it after all that thanks Worth thanks Jimmy <laughs> but they do it all the time they go yeah I've seen that I've seen that and then, then people then post pictures of Jimmy Savile with Maggie Thatcher who knighted him oh mate <laughs> did, did you ever yeah. like that one um, yeah, because I see you always arguing on Twitter with the Brexit. Oh, I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah, There's no point. It. No, um, you know they voted themselves to be poor. What's the point? I don't, I don't know where you get the energy from. It's bad. It's hard enough arguing about United on Twitter, let alone. Uh, yeah, but United is a tricky one because it's it's like now. I mean, I I mean, where my season ticket is, I'm, I was just surrounded at the Liverpool FA Cup game by. Guys from like the the Middle East, Far East, all filming the whole thing on the car to get go like that to the guy's arm. Right. You know that one of those sort of what things. Like, uh, South stand. Right. Fucking hell. Yeah. You know. So oh, you've yeah. done that to yourself. Hey. You've done that. I've, to o- I've always liked the South stand. Why Near where though? the old paddock was. I know, yeah. but why? <laughs> South <laughs> stands are. To be honest with you, I'm not going to start it's singing, am I? It's getting like. That. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going to be singing "Kicking a Blue." You're going home by fucking yeah. ambulance. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> All the old hits, you know. As I was walking, we've got a better night, songbook than that. A scouser asked me for a fight back in the old days, you know. <laughs> um, uh, Terry, honestly, it's been great chatting to you. That, that's just flown by. That, that really. You have to come back again and talk football. I know. Oh, I know. football! Yeah, oh, I'm still traumatized after last night. Well, don't worry about it. You're going to get traumatized again on Sunday, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, the, the worst is yet to come, Terry. Don't worry I about that. I have a feeling um, it is. What are you up to now? Then you've got. Is it this coming back out? Did you say you've got? So doing that for Kindle, right? Um, Oasis book. I'm giving it a rewrite. Word one, I'm still doing the tour, but then I'm bringing back my uh, Naked Confessions of a Recovering Catholic for Edinburgh in August. So I'm taking out to Edinburgh. Have you been there before? No, it, I'm doing seven nights at the stand. And uh, it's, it's better. I, I did a little bit about the Infant of Prague, didn't I? Yeah. So that's part of my Recovering Catholic show. So I do, I do a, like a slideshow presentation on the saints and what good they do or don't do for you. 
Mate, I mean, it basically that that show basically boils down to I'm a bit of a twat, but it's God's fault. <laughs> Michael. There's the, there's the, the title <laughs> of your next, your next book. Uh, there's your autobiography. Uh, Sorry, it's been great chatting to you. Honestly, for me and him, it's, you know, you're a legend and it's been really good reliving some of legend our... Legend old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, go and check out Terry's book and, and all the other good stuff as well. And you're not doing a tour, but you're going to Edinburgh for the... Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm still going to be doing more. I'm going to do, do some warm-ups for Recovering Catholic. I'll do yeah. some more word ones, but I still need to get... Better quality clips stolen. <laughs> right, okay. It was good because I went to see in sale and he had all the clips from the word and it was great. Yeah, yeah, well, there's better ones, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I can work through them all. We do Ollie Reed. Right. Right, because you know. it was good. It was and like, that woman who slaps me. Yeah, that was that was the day. I, that was the same day that Cat and I was banned for the rest of the season. A woman got out of the audience, and you know what I love about the word, right? This is how crazy it is, right? A woman gets out of the audience and slaps you live on the air. You say something, you make a joke, like, I'll give you a tenner later for that, thanks. <laughs> it's good right? for it. Then they go to a break. What do you think they do when they come back off the break? Show the, the footage of him getting slapped again. Yeah, right? the action replay. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you missed this. Yeah, like, as everyone's chanting, no, one, no, one's, and, and yet, no one's got rewind on Sky yeah, no more. Well, so well, like, well, the weird go. thing is, whenever they show that clip in, in uh, you know, the clip things, they never show <laughs> me coming back doing that and yeah. how I handled it, it's always like, yeah, he must have deserved it. Yeah, it was it was nuts. It was funny, like when you were just and then they showed it again. I was like, this show is just unreal. Yeah, it's great. Do you uh, reckon the word was like the precursor for things like Tier Five Fridays? Well, yeah. Well, well Chris Evans stuff. came down every week, but the problem with, with Chris is he, he's I don't know why he did, did your it. Did you pass Cross in radio? Oh yeah. Well, no, not in radio, but I knew him and I knew of him, and he used to come down at the word every Friday with his jotter out. Really? Because he, he got he got so he got a double inspired by it. Then. He got double our budget as well, and then because he was getting the music wrong, he then got the late Pete Mitchell, you know, who I worked with at Key One Hundred Three to sort the music oh, out for him. Yeah. So, but it was quite it was quite weird when they did TFI Friday the album, and it was like Stone Roses were never on TFI. No. <laughs> you know, Happy Mondays had split up before TFI. New <laughs> Order weren't on, so it was like almost as if trying to take over the nineties. Because Chris, God bless him, isn't really into music at all. Not you know, he's not really into anything. And he didn't want to, <laughs> he didn't really want to, he'd be like this, he'd say, right, I'll say this to you, Jay, then you say this back yeah. to me, and then I'll say this. So I'll say, so Jay, what are you doing here today? And you go, who knows? Right. Yeah, who go, knows? Oh, what, what, what are you doing here today? Who knows? Typical of you. You know nothing. Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's an interview with Chris Evans. Yeah, yeah. With Danny Baker writing the replies. <laughs> yeah, because uh, TFI Friday was like, <clears throat> sort of more... Bold, bold, sort of, I don't know, just like a PG ratings, version. Ratings of the went word. down and down That's and down. Did it? it wasn't a success. Whereas yeah. the word, our ratings went up every series yeah. right to the yeah. end. It's, it it, felt it was sort of like maybe it. reported as that it was a fucking success. Though. Yeah, but you see, all the money went with Freud's. They did all his, his PR. Now, if you pay someone like Freud's to do the PR, it's like a protection racket. Got you. So, obviously... It's like you're paying one bunch of public school boys to stop other public school boys in the press having a go at you. Uh, I mean, Jonathan Ross used to used to be really protected in that way and have final, you know what I mean, final uh, copy, copy oh, approval. Really? So he said, I don't like this uh, uh, Jonathan with his floppy hair. Can you put his sculpted hair? You know what I mean? It's that, those little things. I should have had that, but I couldn't afford it. It's also not our style as Mancunians to be asked about mm, stuff like if that. If I'd known about it, I would have done it. <laughs> you know, because it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a good investment. 1500 a month it costs to get Freud's to work. Really? Yeah. <laughs> right, that down, Joe. Yeah. Go we on. need a bit of PR. be a lot more than that. That shit sell for us. No, it'll be a lot more than that now. Yeah. It's a different... I mean, uh, you, you don't need those people anyway once, once, you've got, once you've got your own brand now on the internet, you know. But this is this is what they used to do, you know. Especially TV everything. was. That's the thing with TV is it. YouTube has democratized content creation in a way where, if you're good, people will watch and you'll get found and your audience will find you and they, they keep coming back for this shite every fucking four o'clock on a Friday. <laughs> that's that's the advert we want. For but you. with TV, obviously, you need someone to go. Yes, you. I like you. Oh yeah, yeah, funny, you've, funny you've got me there. Monkey, I like yeah, you. well, don't forget, Manchester was hit for about six months, yeah. and that's how I got the audition for it, and then accidentally got the job because I wasn't nervous at the audition because I thought I've got no chance. <laughs> and the rest is history. That's Terry, right. it's like, been a my, like my career. Hey, no. <laughs> you flying? You're on here. Um, go and check out. <laughs> <laughs> go and 
and check out all the books we've mentioned. Go and check all out right, the tickets are uh, available <laughs> for the tour as well. Uh, what are you up to this weekend? Have you got a game? Yeah, I've got a game tomorrow. Uh, we've got like six home games on the bounce, so if you do, fuck all. Open show tomorrow. Come and have a look. Uh, we won't be as shit as we was last week. No promises, though. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, I think my lad's got a game tomorrow. Hopefully it doesn't get cancelled like all the other ones. Uh, Terry, a pleasure. We'll get you Very on again cheers. to come and chat to us. We could do another five <laughs> hours of this. Oh, I'm sure in the rain on a Saturday Sells morning. It, it? Sells it well. <laughs> hey. uh, go and check out Stephen Housen as well on all his channels on Stratford Paddock FC and all that jazz as well. And a big thank you to Beer52 sponsoring this podcast. That's been Terry Christian. That's been Stephen Housen. I'm Jay Moyer. This has been The Brew. Don't forget to hit like, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching.